and welcome to Art Alive. Today we went to Liverpool John Moores University's John Lennon Art and Design Building for the launch of the first European presentation of Georgi Kepesh, the New Landscape Exhibition, in partnership with Tate Liverpool. Francesco, you are currently showcasing uh, this exhibition at the Tate. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Georgi Kepes? Um, Kepes is really a fascinating experimenter because um, he um, initially worked with Molinage uh, when Molinage was at the Bauhaus. So it was gravitating around the Bauhaus uh, at the beginning of the century. Uh, it was Molinage assistant, studio assistant. And then he moved to America, uh, he moved to Chicago to actually be really founding part of the, of the second Bauhaus, uh, the American version of, of that legendary school. Um, not only was involved in that, but then also he set up in, uh, in MIT in Boston, he set up uh, the Center for Advanced Visual Studies, which is again uh, probably the first really um, research institute and exhibition institute where art, science and other discipline were, were sort of meeting together. And this is the pioneering vision of Kepesh. He was a photographer, he was an artist, but he was also a thinker and one who really wanted discipline to share problems and questions. Can you tell us a little bit about this work? I mean, the, first of all, the exhibition that you're showing at the Tate, uh, how do you recognize this work? What's so particular about, about it? The exhibition we, we, we are showing at Tate is quite different from, from this particular installation because it showcases more or less 80 photographs uh, or I should say photograms. Uh, they are photographs that are done mainly without camera. So they are used, Kepesh used objects to project light and, uh, and shadows on photographic paper. And through that, they create these uh, abstract photograms, which are, which are really beautiful. And it did that uh, more or less at the end of the 40s. While this show, which uh, is a reconstruction of a show from 51, really um, testifies his interest in using other people's images and, and uh, in sort of setting up a critical visual vocabulary. So in this show he uses uh, scientific images that have some sort of formal correspondence uh, to tell us about structures and, and sort of systems which is really uh, one of the main themes that he starts working on and, he, and he, that will carry on throughout his career at MIT. Okay, so it's based on science, exactly? I mean, how can you explain us? These are images from scientific books. So it could be natural history books, it could be encyclopedias. And what Kepes was interested in is not really what they represent, whether they are a picture of a leaf or something else uh, that is occurring in the natural environment, but more like the structure that, that are depicted in the image. So sometimes they are magnified images, some other times they are shadows. And it was interesting showing that there's a sort of recurrence. These are the years of, of structuralism in which people were trying to find you know, invariance and like things that repeat across cultures and different disciplines and different fields and he was trying to map this visually through through these images that we see here behind us. Okay, so it's kind of like geometry in like nature and environment as well? It's that and then it's system theory which eventually comes into cybernetics which eventually comes into into uh, you know computing and algorithms so it's it's really about this um, uh, communication between different disciplines such as mathematics and uh, um, yes the formal elements of art um, but also the idea of languages and codes and how this can um, have share similarities between between them and how art can help um, visualize the similarities and help us better understand the world we're in and so why did you decide to work with LGMU on this exhibition? Well, we work with LGMU on a variety of projects and, and in particular we have a shared member of staff which works half time here uh, and uh, JMU and half time at Tate and, and she's the curator of the exhibition um, uh, here, Isabel, who I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll talk to later on. Um, so that's, that's one element um, and we also collaborate on a series of public activities and, and research elements uh, which can result in seminars held in the gallery or like um, lectures and, and uh, even symposia that we do together. And uh, we are trying to sort of make sure that we have an area of overlap in which here 
there's uh, an interest in producing and disseminating knowledge through the students, but at Tate also we have this interest of like uh, looking at generating new knowledge and sharing it with the public. So on this element, we, we try to find ways to collaborate and find ways of uh, sharing publics. We, we want to talk to JMU students and, uh, and, and JMU wants to talk to our public as, as a sort of way of, uh, uh, of maximizing this dissemination of, of the new, of, of research. Thank you very much, Francesca. I'm now joined with Isabel Whitelake, who's the convener of the Exhibition Research Centre here at LGMU. Hello. Hello. Nice um, can you tell us a little bit how did you work on this project here at LGMU and with the Tate? Sure. Um, well, it began really when I arrived in Liverpool, because I arrived in the autumn to begin a collaborative post between Tate and um, the School of Art and Design here at John Moores. And I discovered that one of the shows that was being planned at that point was an exhibition of the photographs of Georgie Kepesh. Um, and I'd actually come to have an interest in his work from a different direction, which was how Kepesh had worked as an exhibition designer and exhibition organiser, particularly in a project that he developed for the Sao Paulo Biennial in 1969, which is a project that never actually happened. So I thought it would be exciting to bring together his um, photographic works, which are in the Tate collection on display there now, with um, a wider picture of how he was involved in designing and organising exhibitions and how that might be considered into relationship to different kind of political and social contexts that moved from the 50s through to the 60s. So it began like that and I was um, fishing around for possibilities and connections and I found um, at Stanford University John Blackinger had just um, at that moment organised an exhibition about Kepesh's 1951 uh, A New Landscape exhibition. So I got in touch with him and um, everything just came together really in that way. Um, they actually showed the original photographic panels there which are in their special collections but we decided that what we wanted to do was actually refabricate the structure which means that because we, we use new panels we didn't have to treat them like archival materials. We realised that it, the best thing to do actually and the thing more in spirit of the original exhibition was to remake them um, so that we could design it in, in a way that was much closer to the original show. Okay, so um, the exhibition was already at Tate when you decided to take no, part? No, it was, it was kind of on the cards, it was being organised um, and so I had, I had time to kind of do some research before and to make this happen. So why did you choose this one in particular though? I mean, there's plenty of other exhibitions that could be shown. Why Georgie Kippish in particular? Well, it was partly because I had an existing interest in his work, but also because the, the purpose of the gallery programme here and the Exhibition Research Centre is to look in particular at the history of exhibitions. And so he was the one who was um, kind of appropriate to that interest. It was a, it was a good match and because we're working in partnership with Tate and I'm working between and in connection with the two places. It was a good opportunity to kind of bring two different um, contexts together. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm now joined with Edward John Harko, who's the Pro Vice Chancellor for External Engagement at Liverpool John Moore University. Hello. Hello. Uh, can you tell us a little bit how LGMU and Tate work together on this exhibition? Yes, well, we've worked together with the Tate for the best part of two decades, I think, ever since the Tate uh, moved into Liverpool. Um, but in recent years, we've really stepped up that engagement, and we now have a partnership with the Tate. Um, and this exhibition has come out of a joint post that we have between the university's Art and Design Academy and Tate Liverpool. It's a research curatorial post and it allows us to, to do things between the two institutions, to tap into our um, academic establishment and interest, and also to draw on the capacity and the collections and the, and the exhibition um, capability of the Tate. And this exhibition is just the latest example of the way in which we're working together. What has brought the two organizations together, I think, is not only a shared interest in, in art and design and in the history of art, which we teach and we, we research actively in that area as well. But I think, I think we're two anchor institutions here in the city. I mean, Liverpool has had a long transition back 
from the days of being a, a, a port city. It's now uh, still a very significant port city, but it's got a much more diverse and uh, sustainable um, economic uh, makeup. And I think the Tate's investment decision to come and to set up a gallery here in the Albert Dock in Liverpool uh, you know, 20 or more years ago was a very significant boost to a city that was then really struggling to to find its mojo and kind of you know come back from some very very serious and profound economic dislocation. We've been an anchor institution in the city for a lot longer than that, but I think working together we've um, helped the city. I think we rediscover its sense of purpose, its sense of confidence, its interest in the arts and uh, the fact that Liverpool was a you know, European capital of culture in 2008 which was a program of activity that the University and Tate collaborated on very, very strongly. I think all of that you know, really cements our, our alliance. It's not just about education and research, it's also about the vitality of the city region here in Liverpool and making the city of Liverpool a great place to live, work and study. And so, what are the future projects of the Tate and LGMU? Well, we have an extensive program that runs during the course of the year. So, with most of the exhibitions that are on um, uh, Tate Liverpool, uh, our research curator will run an educational program that um, provides our students, typically students on particular courses, an opportunity to go down and to do some educational work around the exhibition. So, for example, a current exhibition is about the Lancastrian artist Leonora Carrington, who became one of the most prominent Mexican surrealist painters. And we've had a number of um, events down at the Tate during the course of the Leonora Carrington exhibition that has provided uh, students opportunities not only to view the exhibition, but to engage with the curators and to do some reading around the subject and to engage, engage creatively with the exhibition that's on. Gyorgi Kepesh, the new landscape, will be on display until the 19th of June. In part two, we'll be at the Tate for another one of our series, 10 Minutes 8, this week about Richard Wentworth's unconventional art piece, Shower. Welcome back to Arts Alive. From Gyorgi Kepesh's new landscape exhibition, we now move on to our series 10 Minutes State, this week about artist Richard Wentworth and his sculpture, Shower. This is a piece by Richard Wentworth, uh, done in 1984. It's called Shower. And it's one of those works of art that annoys a lot of people because it is just a table, uh, what we might call a found object or a ready-made object. Uh, the idea of the found object or the ready-made object was started by a man called Marcel Duchamp. Now he's either a man who gave us lots and lots of freedom in art or he's the man that started lots and lots of trouble in art, depending on your point of view. He's famous, of course, for his, uh, his urinal, which he displayed as a French artist. He displayed this urinal in New York uh, at an exhibition that said it wouldn't reject anything, it would accept anything as art. Marcel Duchamp displays a urinal, those urinals where you go to the gents, gentlemen who are watching there, and put it in a gallery and he called it the fountain, tastefully. And, uh, and of course, it caused a big fuss. You know, you haven't made it, you haven't sculpted it, you haven't painted it. How can that possibly be a work of art? Now, although um, Marcel Duchamp was taking the mickey and had his tongue in his cheek, or taking the pee, maybe even, he was also asking a question. It was an act of philosophy. It wasn't an act of skill or an act of craft things that we might normally associate with art. It was uh, an act of philosophy, if you like. He was saying, if you remove a functioning object away from its function, uh, can it become an art object or not, or what? Oscar Wilde famously said that all art is quite useless. Uh, that's an arguable point anyway. But if we do think that art is quite useless, then if you take a useful object and make it useless, does it become an art object or not? Why do, why do we revere certain objects on plinths and not others? So it raises lots and lots of philosophical questions as to about what art actually is. Uh, since then, a lot of artists like Sir Richard Wentworth here, Richard Wentworth said in 1984 that he was actually working within a tradition. So you might think of the found object or the ready-made as being something quite new in art, but by 1984 he said, well, no, 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 what Marcel Duchamp did, he gave us a material, he gave us a kind of new material, if you like. Somebody once gave us paint, uh, and ever since then we've been thinking, well, what can we do with paint? 
uh, uh, Marcel Duchamp gives us the found object and the ready-made, and artists since then have thought, well, okay, thank you for giving us the, the found object and the ready-made, and also Marcel Duchamp gives us something else, which is the idea of conceptual art, that art can be a concept and an idea, as well as craft and skill and all those other things we enjoy in art, that ideas and concepts are just as valuable. You could have ideas and concepts without skill and craft. Um, so Richard Wentworth was thinking, well, okay, we've got this found object, we've got this ready-made, but I think what Richard Wentworth was interested in, okay, well, what can we do with it now? We've got it, it's allowable now for some of us in art, what can we do with it now? Richard Wentworth, he always kind of subverts very familiar objects, and this whole section of the gallery is full of what might look like very familiar objects, but also they're kind of subverted, so they look quite strange as well as familiar at the same time. Uh, this table, this 1950s table, this ordinary piece of boring furniture, uh, what he's done with it, he's kind of cut off one of the legs a bit there, kind of shortened one of the legs so it tilts, and also it's anchored down by a chain there as well to the ground. There's also this uh, propeller that he's put in there as well. This propeller is from a, a model boat. And what he's, what he, the title of this piece is called Shower, which was kind of inspired by a row of tables that he saw outside a restaurant, kind of rest, uh, tables outside a restaurant in Spain. And there was a big shower of rain, so all the tables were tilted a certain way to let the rain kind of flow off all the tables. And, uh, uh, but also his memory of tables like this um, was quite a strong one. I mean, we've all done this. We've all hid underneath a table as children and pretended it was somewhere else, pretending it's a den, pretending it's a cave, pretending it's my house or whatever. Uh, if you turn a table upside down, this is something I have actually done uh, long ago, by the way, not, not last week, but long, long ago when I was a young boy, uh, turning a table upside down, sitting in the table and, you know, your dad pushing it around and you're pretending it's a boat. So this relationship between a normal, boring, everyday object and the idea of something fantastical and imaginative is something that really appealed to Richard Wentworth. Um, I think also, uh, when you look at this as well, there is this sort of feeling of it kind of maybe bobbling away through the sea with this propeller on the front there. This chain is kind of anchoring it down as well. Now it comes out of something this as well, not just a kind of Marcel Duchamp idea. I think also if you look at Dada, which Marcel Duchamp's kind of, you know, one of the leading advocates of a movement and a style called Dada, uh, and also surrealism, such as, you know, um, you know so, uh, Salvador Dali's uh, Lobster Telephone, for example. Uh, this creative use of found objects and ready-made objects features a lot throughout art, but also it goes back even further than that. Uh, surrealism especially gives rise to looking at objects that are familiar but are somehow subverted in some kind of fantastical way. Um, and a British artist like Richard Wentworth, I'm sure, was very aware of this. There's a sort of British surrealism from the 1930s as well. And we often think of artists like of Paul Nash, for example, from the 1930s in Britain as being almost kind of like a, you know, a second-hand sort of surrealism. The real surrealists are Magritte, you know, the Belgian surrealists, the Spanish Dali, a lot of the French surrealists, the British surrealists we don't really need to think about. But if you think of Britain and its culture going back, right back through to the 19th century, possibly even earlier. If you think of Lewis Carroll, uh, Alice in Wonderland, uh, Alice Through the Looking Glass, if you think of Edward Lear and those nonsense poems, there's always a subversion of the everyday and the normal. If you think, for example, of dishes running away with spoons in the nursery rhymes that you know, these objects that are normal and boring and everyday becoming something special. Another piece that he did actually, just as I'm talking about this, I've just reminded myself that there was another piece where he had a ladder against a wall and there was a shelf on top of, uh, on top of the ladder placed on the wall there with lots and lots of plates on this shelf that were kind of leaning against the wall. And the title was uh, something like Stairway to Heaven, or no, it was called Jacob's Ladder. So it was like a, a ladder to heaven and the plates actually looked like clouds. So again, there was this normal everyday boring objects that we see all around us and he turns them into kind of sculptural arrangements. I actually met Richard Wentworth, I don't know if he remembers meeting me but I remember meeting him a few years back and he was saying that he walks around and everything becomes a sculpture. If you see a skip with a plank of wood next to it so uh, someone can put their wheelbarrow up 
up the plank of wood and dump things into the skip. It becomes a sculptural sort of arrangement of objects, and he's constantly fascinated by the world around him. Uh, he's, he's taken lots and lots of photographs of the world around him. You know, you'll see lots and lots of stub cigarettes uh, between um, cobblestones uh, on, on the ground or something like that, and he'll take a photograph of it and goes, look at those wobbly cigarette, cigarettes in between all the stones there and the regimentation of all the stones. So he's constantly looking at the everyday world as if everything is a kind of palette. Everything is a kind of palette for him to take and make art out of. Everything, everything is a material one way or another. I was mentioning British surrealism there. I was mentioning the name Paul Nash as well. So over there we've got a painting by Paul Nash. This is Harbour and Room by Paul Nash. Uh, Paul Nash is probably famous as, as a war artist in both the First World War and the Second World War. Uh, between the wars though, he was experimenting in lots and lots of ways of making art and thinking about art. Sometimes he went very abstract as well, and sometimes he went very surreal. So this is like a British version of surrealism, if you like. Um, however, he was actually in the, on the French Riviera when he did this painting, and he was staying with another artist, Edward Burra, another uh, well-known British artist as well. And Paul Nash was looking in a mirror, and as he looked in the mirror, he got he, he was quite attracted to the idea that he could see outside by looking at the wall in the mirror, that he could see the exterior, uh, even though he was looking at a wall in the interior. Uh, so playing with mirrors, of course, immediately you start to think of things like Alice through the looking glass here. We've got this mixture of the interior and the exterior. Um, and also we've got this, this mirror as well, so you immediately think of uh, Alice through the looking glass there. But also I think um, there's a scene actually, isn't there, of course, in Alice through the looking glass where she goes into a shop and when she goes into that shop, suddenly it fills with water and she starts rowing through the shop. Uh, there's another one, of course, right at the beginning of Alice in Wonderland, of course, where she cries and she ends up swimming through her own tears. So although British surrealism is often seen as a kind of poor man surrealism compared to other European surrealists, I think surrealism was always there in Britain, long before modernism. Lewis Carroll was often acknowledged um, as, a, as an honorary surrealist um, and by, you know, by, by the likes of Darley, by the likes of Magritte as well. They often referred back uh, to, uh, to, to Lewis Carroll. Uh, Edward Lear, of course, with all those crazy limericks and those crazy rhymes. And of course, there we've got you know, people going to sea in a sieve in Edward Lear's poems and all that sort of um, enjoyment of you know, dishes running away with spoons, uh, a ship here sailing through a living room, a table we've just been talking about there turned as if it's waving through the sea. So this imaginative use of the everyday, it's almost like the artist is being very creative with these everyday objects, but also I think it's up to us as viewers to be creative and be imaginative when we look at these paintings and these objects in this section of the gallery. That's all for Arts Alive. Join us next time. <laughs>